Great. Um, thanks for having me. My talk is five reasons why my friends who don't go to church don't go to church. Um, and I found this talk really hard to write um, because I feel like I've read an abundance of blogs about why people don't go to church. Um, and I think it can be quite cathartic. It's a bit like a guilty pleasure. So you think, yeah, I hate the piece too. Sermons are really boring. This is hilarious. Where's the comment section for this thing? And I seem to find myself in conversations where, instead of defending the church, I'm party to the bashing. So when I started writing, I was tempted to put words into my friends' mouths. I could think about the very worst stories um, about church, read them out, and we could all leave here feeling suitably chastised. And then I realized that actually I very rarely talk to my friends about church, because I don't want to embarrass them, or perhaps more honestly, because I don't want to be embarrassed. So I decided to ask them why they don't go on an anonymous survey. Um, and then I spent Sunday, um, so ironically I bunked off church to write this, um, reading the answers. And they were brilliant. They were really honest. They were personal. They were respectful. And they were quite hilarious. Um, so as a bit of background, when I say friends who don't go to church, I, just, I don't mean those that aren't Christians necessarily. I think it was about a third Christian, a third agnostic, and a third atheist. Um, around half had grown up going to church every week with their Christian parents, and a lot of them had fairly recently been to a wedding um, because we're in our 30s, and that's what you do every summer. Um, so what I'm going to do is read out five short letters which I wrote to people that kindly filled in that survey. Um, but first, a brief list of things that people felt the need to get off their chest, which I don't want to condemn. Um, firstly, flags. Um, personally, I love a flag. If you've never been accidentally caught up in a flag demonstration at Greenbelt, I recommend it. Uh, secondly, overly strong orange juice. Um, I think that ratio is very subjective. Um, the music where you feel sorry for the person playing and no one else is joining in. Basically, join in. Um, and fourth, someone wrote, I never got to play Mary. I was always God and the narrator as I had a loud voice. When I played God, I had to hide behind a pew so no one would see me. Brackets, sad face. Um, I think casting's tough. Um, I would like to apologise to the person who went to church where they locked the doors at the back of the service so you couldn't leave. Um, they wrote, they were nice guys when you talked to them, but it's a bit much. Uh, I think we can all agree on that one. So first, the letters. Um, so the majority of people that filled it in said, I don't go because I don't believe in God or Jesus. And to them, I'd say, you're right, that's a pretty straightforward answer. And you're right that you can't get away from the fact that it's about God and Jesus. And I understand why it might seem pointless to attend. Um, somebody requested that I quote, no gods, no masters, while raising my outfist, outturned fist to the sky. So there you go if you're watching it, whoever filled that in. Um, but for the people who feel that you have to believe or subscribe to something to walk through the doors, um, please know that's not the case. One of you said that you would go if you could just suspend your disbelief. And one of you loves the quiet and peace that can be found in church. And you said it's a shame that you can't go because to do so would make you a hypocrite. And to that person I say, please come, because if we only let in the people who could sign up to the 39 articles, we would have even fewer people than we do now, and the church is for everyone. Uh, secondly, to the people who said, I don't go because I don't want to go on my own, I have to say, I'm sorry for not asking you. I assumed you didn't want to go. I didn't want to sound like Lynn when she invites Alan Partridge to her Baptist church after he fails to get a second series, and he's more interested in the barbecue with Chris Rea. You probably have your own green celebrity dinner dates to solicit, I reasoned. And it is hard to go on your own. I hate it too. I share your fear of being stared at. I have a vicar friend who invites people to meet him at Walthamstow Tube Station if they want to walk into his church with someone. I think that's a great idea. And to the people who feel that they might not belong or that they can't find somewhere they feel at home, I would say, personally, I think it's okay to shop around. But part of the joy of church is that you're sharing space with people that you might never otherwise encounter. One of you asked, where are all the normal people? And I'm guilty of desperately trying to prove a lot of the time that you can be Christian and normal. But actually, some of the best people at my church don't feel that need to prove they're normal. Uh, the poet Philip Larkin described church as a serious house on a serious earth in whose blent air all our compulsions meet. And maybe you have more in common with the people who don't seem normal than you realise. Third, to the people who feel rejected by the church because they're gay. 
I'm so sorry that you feel rejected, and I'm glad that you went to that wedding with a nice, down-to-earth, fun vicar who accepted you was an enthusiastic and inspiring. And I'm sorry that you then saw what you call the usual anti-gay church stuff on the news and got scared off again. There are lots of churches where you will be welcome with open arms and an increasing number of them, and I'd love to help you find one. To the atheist who questions why, if God was good and had one chance to write a book to send to humanity, he wrote a piece of homophobic homophobic propaganda. Um, Yes, that would be whack. Great word. And maybe reading it in context does seem like a complete cop-out. And I'm sorry that when you ask questions in church growing up, you got fobbed off, because that is infuriating. But there are some really excellent scholars out there who are bore cop-outs even more than you. And I have about a million book recommendations for you. And because I work at the church times, I get a 30% discount. Uh, Fourthly, to all the people who felt judged. And that includes the person who, while drinking at university, was confronted by a chaplain waving a letter from his minister back home. Also to the person told at a youth group that masturbation was the most dangerous threat to the safety of college students. Um, Thank you for sharing these memories, and I'm glad that some of you can look back on these and laugh. On the other hand, it sounds like some of you have been devastated by your experiences of judgment, gossip under the banner of holding each other accountable, and public shaming. You're right, it's toxic. I don't know whether we ever can get you back. You've been badly burned, and I wouldn't blame you if you felt the need to stay away. The points at which the church touches people's lives are often the pivotal ones, births, weddings, funerals. And when it gets those wrong, it's really hard to take time to forgive and forget. I also worry that anything that I might say might make it worse. So just thank you for writing about them, and I hope you're okay. I hope you find really kind people who can undo some of that damage. You wrote that initially you were heavily involved, welcomed, and told that you were loved for who you are. You'd never experienced anything like that before. I want to say that's the true bit, not the judgment, and you're lovely. And fifthly, to the people who don't go but have had a good experience of church, and I don't know that doesn't strictly fit my category of why they don't go, but I think that's important too. And I don't think the moral is that if we did more of these things that more people would come. But they do suggest to me that most of my friends aren't staying away because they've never been blessed by the church. So this is a shout out to the person who felt a skin tingle and a sense of excitement during a service, and thank you for teaching me the word numinous. Secondly, to the lapsed Catholic who was blown away by a Good Friday liturgy. Thirdly, to the person who was brought to tears by the local church choir. Fourthly, to the atheist who saw his grandmother comforted at his uncle's funeral and who senses goodwill to all men at midnight mass with his dad. And fifthly, the church who told my friend that it was lending its house when the, when the atheist friend they just met had died. And that person wrote, it was very humane and gracious and it made me love them. So to conclude, I know that the church has got a lot wrong and it's failed to own up to that and there's plenty of repenting to do. But I'm glad that almost all of you were able to recall a good experience. Sometimes I feel that I have to be so apologetic when I talk about church. I have to beat you to the joke about cults, sandals and songs of praise and that I won't take offence if you crack a joke about bashing a bishop. I think I've been a bit dishonest and disingenuous, really, because I love my church. The orange squash is reasonably strong, and generally we join in, unless it's that new song that starts really low. There are no flags, and we don't lock the doors at the back. It starts at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday, and I might be late because I personally feel awkward during the actions to the kids' songs. That's reason number six, and I stand by it. Thank you. (laughs) 